Amen. Amen. Next week, uh, Brenton is going to be bringing us the word. This is going to be his first time uh, doing that, not just with us, but first time <laughs> preaching. So we are very excited about that. And um, I'm, I say that because I want, I want you to be praying for him as he's continuing to prepare. He's been preparing for a while. Don't you get away from me. Uh, I, I am so thankful to have these guys here. And, and I just want us to take a moment to pray as a family for our family here who's going to be bringing us the word next week. And um, so let's just, let's just take a moment, okay? Father, I thank you so much, Lord, for uh, the work you've been doing in Brenton's life, Lord, and just what I see you are stirring within him and what you are, how you're growing him, Lord, and how you are equipping him. And God, mostly, I just, I just thank you because I see such a sincere love for you and, and uh, just such a gratefulness to be in relationship with you. And so, Lord, I just want to pray you continue to just move in him this week and guide and lead him, Lord, and, and just continue to um, put the words down, Lord, that you want there, him to share with us, uh, to, to, to share your word with us and to share his life with us, Lord. And what you're doing in it. And so, Lord, I pray you just bless him, protect him, Father, please, so that, Lord, he can just completely focus upon uh, finishing that out and, and preparing that word to bless you and to bless us and, uh, and to challenge us. And so we just pray for him as, as your family and his family and all of our family, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, buddy. If you see him leave during the service throughout, it's, it's not because he's always offended by what I say, okay? It's because he still has to work, and so unfortunately he can't quite get the Sundays off uh, yet, but he's, he's begged, and they've allowed him now for next week. If not, it'll be a very short sermon, so, so I'm very grateful, uh, and, and actually you'll become the favorite then because you'll have preached like in this amount of time, so that'd be, that'd be great. Uh, so we've been talking about these words that Jesus has said, and this is the final week for that. You're supposed to go, aw, aw. So, and then we don't ever have to talk about Jesus again, right? So no, no, no. Uh, this has been a really good series, though. It's been a hard series. Um, I don't know about you, but my soul has been sweating as, as I've been going through this. Because I'm not just talking at you. I'm talking to myself here. And it is hard words that Jesus has because he's trying to free us from all this garbage and this stuff that we've accumulated in our lives and saying, I'm going to bring you back to what I intended for you. Uh, uh, thank you so much for that scripture of, first, of, of John, Ray. I appreciate you sharing that with us because it was like some sad words there. He came in here, but we didn't recognize him. He, he dwelt amongst us, the, the very author of life, and we're like, who's this? What a sad, sad condition we are in when we're apart from him. We're so blind without that. So I, I am so grateful for that passage that you shared with us because he suddenly becomes visible by going up on the cross and going, oh, I get it now. So thanks for sharing that with us, Ray. Um, but, but we're going to conclude this series today, and then Brenton's going to preach next week or share with us, and then... Uh, Brett's going to share with us the week after. Uh, I am so excited. I am so excited to see, again, God bringing these voices in here to us. So um, just continue to be praying for these folks, for these brothers as they're getting prepared to, to bring these messages. Um, I, I know I say this. I've been saying this each week. I think this is going to be the toughest week. You know, like this is this one really. You don't want to be here. You want to be at home munching on your Captain Crunch and in your jammies and all that sort of thing. This one's tough. I'm not going to lie. This one's tough. It's tough for me. Uh, so I, I, maybe you all are spiritual like Jedi masters at this point where you don't, you're like, I'm good. I've been good. This is great. But this one's been tough. Um, and I, my guess is each week it's maybe been tough for different ones of us. Like the whole idea of loving your enemies. <sighs> that one's tough. I've heard some feedback on that one. They're like, Paul, that was not cool. You should not have said that. No, they didn't say that. But they, they said that was tough because I, I have some real enemies in my life. Um, for some of you, it's just wrapping your head around this whole thing of, wait, Jesus is the only way? And what that really means, and, and we got to unpack that a bit. 
Today I want you to, again, enter into this story in God's Word, and we're going to look at it in Mark chapter 10, so you can open up Bibles or the Bible app. Again, we've got our events on there in the Bible app. Please, please go there, and you can see it throughout the week. We have the notes, the announcements, everything, prayer requests. And Mark is one of those narratives about Jesus' life. There are four narratives in the Bible that we call the Gospels, and they're stories about the public ministry of Jesus. And we're going to be looking at the Gospel of Mark. Uh, John is another one, which Ray read out of this morning. And this particular story is also found in Matthew 19 and Luke 18. But for today, we're going to look at Mark chapter 10. It says, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Now, before we go any further, we'd like to stop and kind of pick out some of these cool facts about this. And not just to learn facts, but to learn significance, to understand what's going on. Matthew calls him young. Luke calls this person a ruler. All three versions call him wealthy. And the significant note is that he ran. Now, in that day, men didn't run. And it wasn't because they, they were uh, not able to. It was considered undignified. Just undignified. Especially if you were a man of wealth or power or position you most certainly didn't run. You, you had others run for you. Imagine like Mark Zuckerberg, CEO of Facebook, young guy. He ain't running to any meetings that he's late for, and nobody's going to expect him to. He's going to show up when he wants to show up. It was that kind of way there. But this young man, in some ways, because of his culture, he threw all the respectability, and he just fell down at Jesus' feet. And he says, good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, this is, again, uncommon things here because good is never used with people. Good was only used to describe God and God alone. And the question is odd, too, because the Jews would know exactly the answer to this question. Verse 18, though, says, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy, which would have been about the age of uh, 13. Evidently, though, this young man had heard about Jesus' teaching, and, he didn't, and they didn't treat the law the same way. And do you notice that Jesus only lists the commands that are like the outward commands? You know, the commands that you could, somebody would know from watching this young man's life. Like, yeah, no, he doesn't dishonor his parents. I, I've seen that. They, he's not, uh, he doesn't defraud people. Um, certainly haven't known him to murder anybody or anything like that. The inwards commands of like, have no other God before me or do not covet. The inward things that nobody could see. Jesus doesn't mention that. Interesting. Verse 21, Jesus looked at him and loved him. That's a powerful phrase, isn't it? And then the man went away rejoicing. The end. Isn't that what it says? I'm just making sure you're still awake. You haven't fallen asleep yet. Wouldn't that be nice? You know, Jesus said, well, just do this and you're good to go. Jesus sees beyond that. He sees beyond that. See, and I think, I think this young man knew there was something missing there was something missing. I think you're here this morning because you know something is missing in your life. I think you know it. And I think you know exactly what it is. And I pray that, that God's word speaks to you this morning. Not me, but his word speaks to you this morning. That his Holy Spirit is there pointing you to what is missing there in your life. And as he's exposing what's missing in my life. See, this young man, he knew there had to be more. Because Matthew's version says, the man says, what do I still lack? And then Jesus answered, well, one thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and, and follow me. And then what some call the saddest verse in the Bible, I think it's the second. I think the first was when God asked the question, Adam, where are you? I think that's incredibly sad. But some, some folks think this is the most uh, saddest statement. At this, the man's face fell, and he went away sad because, well, he had great wealth. See, as far as I can tell, this is the only instance where someone comes to Jesus 
with a great need and they leave without that need being fulfilled because I don't think they allowed Jesus to fulfill it. I believe the man really wanted to follow Jesus sincerely, but just not that much. See, the one thing was more important to him. And then I think he went away weeping. And today, in many ways, it's the culmination of what we've been looking at over these last six weeks. All these things that we, we say that we wish Jesus hadn't have said, because they're hard statements. Each of them calls us to let go of something, to give up something, maybe just that one thing. You know, we looked the first week, lose your life, and then you'll find it. Jesus says, anyone who tends to come with me has to let me lead. It means letting go of your control, letting go of your autonomy. It's realizing we sometimes even pack too many things in our little spiritual bags and learning to travel a whole lot lighter. Then we looked at loving your enemies. <laughs> that was a big one. That was a tough one. Letting go of that reflex that we've developed to punish those people that have hurt us. Um, and, and letting go of the need for vengeance. Letting go of those things that, that people do, the evil things that hurt us or hurt others. And letting go of that reflex that we gotta, we got to demand justice right here, right now. Get rid of the list of the people and the list of their offenses against us. Just letting that go, turning that over. Jesus said, you know, you've heard it said, eye for an eye. And I tell you, give them the other cheek as well. Love your enemies. That was brutal. Jesus, what are you talking about? I got to have my vengeance. I got to get even. That was brutal. But again, Jesus is trying to free us. We're learning to let go of those things that just hold us down. And then we talked about if your right eye offends you, pop it out, gouge it out. Gruesome things, gruesome analogies and examples that Jesus is going to to tell us, this is how serious I want you to treat sin because we have a bit of a distorted view of it. And to simply let go of those things that want to control our lives, things that we think we have control over, but we actually don't, and turning them over to Jesus. Then we looked at, if you don't forgive, surrendering the bitterness, the deep, deep hurt that's been there for such a long time, and learning to forgive. Stop putting the measuring stick to everybody. Because when we do, we set the prisoner free, which we find is normally us. We're the real prisoner. And then we looked at that statement, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And letting go of all the other signs around us that keep pointing us in every other direction, but the direction Jesus is pointing us to. Letting go of this perception that Jesus is threatening us with these words. Or that it's narrow-mindedness, but he's rather saying, these are words of comfort. These are words of hope. Because I'm the only one coming to give you life. Real, true life. Nobody else is doing it. Nobody else is coming for you. Everybody else is saying, you're either up, stuck with what you got, or you're going to have to work your way to me. And Jesus is saying, no, I know you can't do that. I'm coming for you. I'm the one giving you life. And then we looked last week, go make disciples. And in light of Jesus coming to give us life, he's saying, I want you to go and not leave anybody out, but bring everybody with you. That's what this is all about. And I'm going to come with you even in this. And being able to let go of the misunderstandings that we have when Jesus says to go make disciples. Because we don't want to be just on bullhorns yelling at people or doing sales jobs. Because that's not what this is about. But rather, as you go, don't leave anybody out. And then this one from Mark 10. Some ways, it, it sums it all up. He says, sell everything. Let it all go. I, I, I know when we've, we've moved multiple times... And when we do multiple moves like that, I end up with no keys for just a, for just a brief, brief moment of time, you know? Like you, you sell the cars, you sell the, the house, or you stop renting the house or the place, and it is the most freeing thing. I'm not making light of, of homelessness, so please do not miss, miss hear what I'm saying. There's for a moment, I don't own anything. I don't have anything like that. And it is the most freeing feeling sometimes. I always like tell Abigail, I'm like, I got, we don't have any keys, honey. We're free. We're free. I wonder what God's going to 
do with us now. I wonder where he's going to take us now. It's just such a freeing feeling with that. Sell everything. Let it all go. Jesus is saying, just in case I missed anything here that's hard to give up, here's the one thing that you lack. So the question is always then, does this passage mean I can't own anything? Is that what Jesus is telling us here? Sell everything? You can't own anything, right? I don't think it's so much as Jesus saying you can't own anything as it is Jesus telling us that nothing can own us. That's a massive difference, isn't it? I, I got some shoes on, but somebody needs some shoes. Dude, here's a size 12 right here. I got another pair. They're not mine. God's given me the ability to have this. It's yours. It's yours. Nothing can control you. Nothing can hold you down or hold you back from this vital relationship. Nothing can get in the way between you and your relationship with God is what he's saying. Nothing else can own you. There's no other ownership to this. I, I remember I was talking at a, uh, a Catholic renewal in Ireland, and uh, I had said something to this effect, and I, I overheard that there was a guy in the back. He was having a bit of difficulty with this. He says, you mean, you mean I'm supposed to love God more than my family and take care of my family first and all this? And, and they're like, yeah, that's what he's saying here. That's, well, that's what the scripture's saying here. He's, oh, I just can't see that. I just can't, can't get there with that. That's not, that's not right. That's, I got to take care of my family first. And we have this, this distorted view that we actually can own things or people or relationships. And it's God who has given us this in the first place. He's given us life. He's given us family. He's given us everything. Do you have that one thing in your life that, nope, sorry, can't do it. Can't let that one go. Do you have that? You want to raise hand or maybe even get up here and I'll let you have the mic and you can tell us what. No, we don't want to do that. I won't do that. We're not that kind of church. We all do. So let's just put that out there. We all have that one thing. Maybe it's even two or a dozen. <laughs> I don't know. I know I'm a hot mess with it. So do you have that one thing? Well, then let's flip it around. Let's flip it around because that's what Jesus does here in the scripture. Maybe the more important way to look at it is, is there one thing that you would give everything else up for? Let's, let's look at it like that. The one thing that is worth absolutely everything. Jesus asked that here. Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, it says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And in his joy, he went and sold all he had, and he bought the field. Did you notice that? He hid it again. He didn't want to take the chance of anyone else finding this. And verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. And when he found the one of great value, he went away and sold everything and bought it. Kind of makes you wonder, like, how did this merchant recognize instantly the value of this one pearl? Well, evidently, he had measured the value of many lesser pearls that he had discovered in his life. Some of you maybe have that same understanding now. You've measured the value of these lesser pearls, and they ain't worth it. They're just not going to give you all that you want, all that you need. They're not going to satisfy your soul that the love that only a living God can give you. There's a story uh, from Tommy Oak. Some of you have heard of him. He's a pastor and storyteller. And he tells a story about one summer when he was out in Oregon. And he met a man who sold toys, specifically toy toy cars, Matchbox, Hot Wheels. How many have them? Matchbox, Hot Wheels. Love them, love them, still love them. Um, and, he made, and this man made a pretty good leaving, uh, living with this. He would go to toy shows and car shows, traveling to convention centers and everything. And Tommy said he asked the man, hey, how would you get into this business? I mean, it's not your everyday business. And the man explained, well, I bought a whole store of Matchbox cars. Well, how much did that cost you to buy the whole store, Tommy asked. And the man says, one car. Well, how did that work? Well, the man started to tell the story. He says, well, when my grandfather died, he left me a bunch of boxes of stuff. And I started going through all these boxes. And, and in them were three green Volkswagen matchbox cars. And they were still in their original boxes. 
Some of you are already starting to think, okay, I'm going home, getting up in the attic, I'm going through the rubbish. Like, wait, just stop. You can do that later. Stop thinking on it now. Just follow me here. And I began to think, he says, I've been in a lot of different stores and many conventions, and never had I ever seen a green Matchbox Volkswagen. And I waited until there was a trade show in my town, he says, and I put one of those cars in my coat pocket in its package, and I went off to this trade show. I went to this booth with this one gentleman over in the corner, and he had hundreds and hundreds of Matchbox cars. And I went over to him, and I asked, I said, hey, have you ever seen a green Matchbox Volkswagen? The man says, no, but do you know where one is? Well, maybe. How much would it be worth? And the man said, oh, it'd be worth a lot, because there were actually only five of them ever made. And this guy's thinking, I, I got three. I got three right now. This man went on to say, the Matchbox people do it like this. Every year they make a bunch of cars, and every year they'll just make a car that's rare and only make a few of them. And that, that particular green Volkswagen, apparently this guy was very familiar with it, they only made five green Volkswagens in the whole world. Well, that's interesting. Uh, how much would one of those be worth, the man asked. He says, well, I'll tell you what, I'd give my whole store for just one. So the guy pulled out his pocket, put the package on the counter, and laid it out there. And without the blinking of an eye, the man says, it's yours. You have the whole store. All for the one green matchbox Volkswagen. Is there anything so powerful or meaningful in your life? Is there anything so valuable right now that you'd sell the whole store for it? You'd swap it without even blinking an eye. Is there anything like that in your life right now? You're like, man, I'd give it all up for that right now. Right now. A friend of mine was telling me about a story he had a conversation with with another friend of his, and we'll just call him Bill and Jay for right now as I won't reveal who they are. But uh, Bill was saying that he has this, he was talking to his friend Jay, and Jay was saying, you know, I got, I got some friends in my life that are, they just don't have any desire or any interest, it seems, in faith in Jesus at all. And he said so desperately, he says, you know, I don't know what to tell them. I mean, we all probably have these friends in our life. They're happy with their life. They, they love how they live. They, don't, they say they don't need anything. Just a life filled with things that make them feel good. See, faith in God or in Jesus, it, it doesn't matter to them at all. And then he, Jay says, why should it? See, so many times it's a question of relevance. Like, what am I going to get from this even? Why does that matter? Why would they turn their back on whatever it is that they think they have or that gives their life meaning? I mean, they do whatever they want with whoever they want. And then Jay starts getting louder in the conversation. He's like, why would they let go of all of their life and all their friends and everything they're doing for this Jesus thing? I mean, what is this faith in God and Jesus anyway? Why does it matter? And at this point, the conversation's getting a little, a little tense, not in an angry, con confrontational way, but it's like, in the way that this question is so important to me right now, and kind of like my life is hanging in the balance by even asking this question. I'm not sure any of us would know exactly what to say, but Bill said this. He says, uh, my, my, my answer was this. He says, my, my belief in Jesus is a belief in something bigger than myself, something that gives me hope, something that gives me meaning when I cannot find any meaning. And he says, it gives me someone to trust when I can't seem to trust anyone. And it gives me an unconditional love that highlights the small-mindedness that I have that so many times makes me incapable of imagining a world much larger than my own. And then Jay spoke up, and, and it was pretty tense at this point. And he says, but they say they don't want that. They say there's nothing that they actually need. There's not the one thing that they lack. And, and Jay says, and I believe them. And Bill says, well, I don't believe them. He says, I'm not trying to be presumptuous, knowing that I know, saying that I know everyone's heart. But he says, I'm just saying that loneliness and fear and hopelessness are things that we like to hide. And we want to hide behind anything that we can find so that nobody else sees that. 
And Bill says, I, I, I believe if you get them by themselves, get them to actually be honest and real, just like it would be for most of us, that deep down they're so lonely and so scared, and this is all they know. See, I don't believe, he says, that anything in this world compares to life with Jesus, with this more and better life that he invites us to share in. See, I want to sell the whole store to buy that one thing. I want to give it up because knowing him is everything. Having him in my life, me being in his story again, is so powerful. Paul says to the Philippians, as he's writing about his reputation, his pedigree, his elite tribe of Judaism, uh, uh, he is a devout follower of the Old Testament and a defender of the religion. And then he writes this, and I'll say this in the message version, verse 7, says, the very credentials these people are waving around as something special, he says, I'm tearing it all up and throwing it all out with the trash, along with everything else I used to take credit for. And why? Because of Christ, he says, yes, all these things I once thought were so important are gone from my life compared to the high privilege of knowing Christ Jesus as my master firsthand. Everything I once thought I had going for me is insignificant. And then he calls it dog dung. I've dumped it all in the trash so I can embrace Christ and be embraced by him. I didn't want some petty inferior brand of righteousness that comes from keeping a list of rules when I could get the robust kind that comes from trusting Christ. I love that, that version of that. I love that. So he says, so that I can embrace Christ and be embraced by him to be embraced by our creator, by the one who loves us and made us out of love. It's like it's a coming home. It's a coming home, folks. That's what it is. That's why I'm willing to give everything else up because I want to come home. You remember that, that line, that verse from Mark 10, Jesus looked at him and loved him. See, I think more than anything, Jesus wanted this man to know just his overwhelming love that he had for this young man. Brendan Manning uh, tells the story if um, Danielle wants to come on up here and the team. Brendan Manning tells the story. Uh, he was leading a spiritual retreat for a group of women throughout the weekend. Uh, he'd offer these guided quiet times for them. And they'd go and they'd come back and, and Brendan would ask them to journal about what scriptures or they read or prayers that they prayed. And then they'd come back and they'd share what they'd learned or with the others in the group. And there was this one woman named Agnes, and every time it was her turn to share, she'd say, I, I just don't have anything to share. I'm not hearing anything. I'm not seeing anything or feeling anything. I, I must be doing something wrong. And Brenda said, no, no, you're not, you're, you're not doing anything wrong. It's just different for you. And she said that though this is frustrating, it he said, look, I know it's frustrating, but it will come. It will come. Don't worry. So they went throughout the weekend. They kept on with the same thing until they reached the last session. And Brendan told the group, look, I just want you to go out. I just want you to write what it would be like if you came face to face with Jesus. Think about that. Just you yourselves right now. Just think. What would you say? What verse would come to mind? What prayer would you want to pray if you were face-to-face -face with Jesus right now? And it says that this group came back, and they all circled up, and everybody was sharing about their time, and, and uh, it was just so amazing for each one. And finally, they got to Agnes, and Brendan asked her, hey, is there anything that you want to share this time? Did you encounter anything? And she said, yes. And here's what she said. She said, I I'm not sure how to explain it, but it was something like a dream. And I was sitting there asking God to just show his love for me and help me understand this one thing in my life that's missing. And she said, suddenly I, I felt like I was in this huge ballroom and there was a dance going on and there were people there and, and the women were wearing these beautiful gowns and the men were wearing these handsome tuxes. And she found herself walking into this ballroom with this beautiful dress on that she'd never seen before. And she said she walked in and everybody was dancing these beautiful dances and they were elegant, beautiful people. And she says, everywhere I looked, everyone was dancing perfectly, not one misstep. And she said, I went over and I stood 
on one side in the corner. And I stood there for a couple of songs. And then, then there was a dark corner. And now this dark corner, this gentleman just stepped out. And, he, and she said, I, I don't know if he'd been there the whole time. I, I don't know, but I just noticed him. And he came up, and he was so handsome. And he had on this beautiful black tux with this red flower. And he came over to me, and he says, can we dance? And I said, okay, but I'm not very good. And, and he said, it's okay, I'll lead. And he took me out on the floor, she says, and we began to dance. And she says, I'd never danced like that before. And he spun me around, and he dipped me, and he slowly, everyone else began to spread out amongst the edges and just watched us. And she said, we spun and we turned and we were elegant and graceful. And as the song ended, everyone around the circle began to clap for us. And she said that he looked down and he says, thank you for having this dance with me. And then he, he looked up and when he did, she said she just knew it was Jesus. And he looked me in the eyes and she said in my heart and soul, I just knew it was him. And he said, thank you for this dance, Agnes. Oh, and one more thing, I'm crazy about you. She says, that's what it's like to be embraced by the love of the Father that I have never, ever experienced before. That is the love of God. So instead of hearing me just say, sell everything, don't get owned by anything, or just give it all up, I just want you to say, Lord, would you just love me? Would you just come near to me? So that I'm embraced by the loving arms of my heavenly Father, the one who I've been intended to be in this relationship from the get-go. To fill me with the love that only you can do, that I've never experienced before. If we could just have the lights down. if you could look at it as if someone just asked you to dance just just to be with you and you alone what if this person just said I am absolutely crazy about you because that's what Jesus did by going to the cross for us he says I am I'm obsessed with you I love you so much and I don't want you to suffer I don't want you to be broken anymore I want you to come home I want you to be with me once more like I intended for you to be with me in the first place. That is the love of God. Lord, we thank you so much that you laid each arm out on the cross. I don't believe for one second you fought those soldiers. You allowed them to drive the nails into your hands and your feet. You allowed them to pierce your side. You allowed them to just beat you and scourge you, slam that crown of thorns on your brow, Lord, on your head. You did not resist because, Lord, you were relentless about coming to us and bringing us back to you, back to the loving arms of the Father who created us out of love and who wants us to be back in love with us again. Lord, if there's one thing in our life, if we're even just fortunate to have just one thing that we're holding on to, Lord, much less many things, Just come near to us now, Lord. And help us just to lay that down, just to let it go, because it, it's, it doesn't even come close to comparing with you. Lord, maybe there's something in our life right now, Lord, that we just, we need to hand over to you. Would you give us courage? Would you fill us with your peace to know we can trust you with that? Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's our possessions because we've never had much and now we're getting it and we don't want to let it go. But we're actually finding we're getting known by it, Lord. So can we just hand that off to you, Lord? 
Lord, you, you alone know. Your Holy Spirit's moving right now in each one of us. And I pray that, Lord, your grace, that you are just walking with us and just putting, your, putting our hand in yours and helping us now to hand this over to you. Because we only want to be with you. Would you just move now, Lord, as we sing? Just be gentle with us, Lord. And if we need courage to move our feet forward to come and pray with somebody, then, Lord, give us that boldness to now step out. There's folks in the back there that will pray. There's folks going to be up here, Lord. Just give us courage, Lord, as we start to hand ourselves more and more over to you. Lord, maybe there's somebody here that we just need to start journeying alongside of to say, can you walk with me on this? Lord, make those people just visible to us right now that we know that's a safe person. That's a good person I can just walk with. And they're going to journey alongside me. Help me to learn this life that you've intended for me to live. And together, hand it over to you. Let's just sing this song as the, as the love of the Father just moves in our hearts, giving us peace, giving us hope, giving us courage. Come find grace. Come find forgiveness for all of that nonsense. Come lay it at the foot of the cross. We pray in Jesus' name.